Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. I hope you've all had one amazing week. Welcome back. And I want to welcome Mr. Tony Mance to the podcast. I met Tony uh, on a Facebook group here in Australia. He actually doesn't live that far away from me. We share the same beach and um, his story just blew out. Like I really had to make contact with this guy. He, we're going to talk about how he leads his own way and how he gives back to the world um, after a 30-year cocaine binge. Just unbelievable. I, when I saw those words, I had to, to speak to him about what he's doing, you know, and how, he, how he's come out of that. Um, he talks about his childhood experiences uh, with an absent father, a mother with schizophrenia. He is, an, he is a mastering engineer. Um, I will let Tony talk a little bit more into that. I never knew what that was until I met Tony. But he talks about the challenges that he faces in the music industry. We discuss thoughts of suicide uh, and a lot about a, a self-reflection and empowering many amazing topics of how he's come out of, um, the, 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 you know, dealt with the adversity. Um, you know, something where I really connected with Tony as well was where he talks about the tall poppy syndrome and, and, and how it is a cultural phenomenon here in Australia. Uh, you know, if you've never heard of the term tall poppy syndrome, that is the criticism and belittlement of successful individuals. Something that I actually called my story, which I'm happy to share uh, from the book, How to Lead with Purpose, that's on the shelf behind me. My story is called tall poppy syndrome. I felt somebody told me that when I suffered with some of the trauma that I had to deal with um, uh, not so many years ago. Well, yeah, recent, you know, in the last decade anyway. Um, but this is all about Tony and his journey, and I'm going to let Tony share it. But, you know, one thing you have to love about Tony is his honesty, he, he, the rawness that he brings to the discussion. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, sit back. We'll be back in 21 seconds. Enjoy the show with Tony. Welcome to Leading Our Own Way. I'm your host, Andrew White, and this is the podcast that unveils captivating narratives of resilience and personal triumph. This podcast is for anyone seeking inspiration and insights on overcoming life's challenges. Follow and subscribe, and then we can lead together forever. Mr. Tony Mance, welcome to Leading Our Own Way. How are you, brother? Andy, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm, oh. doing, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Good, man. Yeah, it's good to see. And, you know, yeah, no, I um, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, I know you're going to bring a, a lot of vulnerability to this episode, and I really appreciate that. Um, um, but, you know, you are one of the first out of the, you know, the first of a few. Um, but, the first, yeah, first of you that I don't actually know. I reached out to you. Uh, I saw a post online about your vulnerability. You were just so open about what you've been through and what you're doing. And I just, I just had to reach out to you. And luckily you responded and you were more than willing to chat. We've been bouncing back and forward for a few weeks now. And I, it's time to drop this episode. And I'm so, so grateful, uh, Tony. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, well, I, pre I appreciate the opportunity. And, um, and uh, yeah, look, no, no problems with sharing stuff. I, I guess that um, as someone who's trying to... Um, I don't think you can help people. You can only serve them. But yeah. as someone who really is trying to serve people, I think I can do a better job by being brutally honest and transparent about things, um, especially when you're trying to, um, in my case, mentor people of all ages, but primarily young artistic creative kids because that's, um, you know, the music world is my world. Um, mm. but, but certainly a lot of the stuff I talk about can relate to uh, others who aren't necessarily artistic creative, just, just um, men in particular in general because, mm. um, you know, like a lot of people out there, I've had my own journey with it and experienced a lot of things that um, young men, middle-aged men uh, go through and are challenged by. And uh, I'm grateful that I've pretty much gone through the worst of it. Uh, you know, there's always the usual caveat. Everyone's always uh, the work in progress and always things to learn. And uh, apart from all the usual cliches, but as far as the big monkeys on my back, the gorillas, as it were, they're well and truly off now. Um, mm -hmm. So hopefully um, for those people that are open to listening and considering what I have to say, yeah, I uh, might be able to give them a sense of hope. Um, but I think um, you, you really need to be very, very honest, uh, very open 
about your world, about your past, um, because uh, a lot of people experience similar thing, and it's important that people don't feel like they're an island unto themselves when it comes to whatever challenges that they may be facing in life. Yeah, and I know you're going to bring that vulnerability because I saw the rawness, uh, the rawness on your on your writing in your words, uh, and that's what leading our own way is all mm. about: creating that safe space for people mm. just to be boom. You know, and the, the uh, not judgment. I hate that space. You know, no judgment here. No, just just you know, being authentic, being yourself, and 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 be people just willing to listen to it because mm-hmm. it'll create some you know personal development strategies for people. I'm sure, um, you know, some people who'll be watching this will be able to connect to your story some way, whether it's personal for them or whether it's you know other people in their families or friends that have been aware of. And yeah, sure. um, but before we go down that road. Um, how are you today, though? How are you? not just today? Generally speaking, today, you know, day what's to going on for you? Look, look, I'm I'm good, man. I really am. Um, I turned sixty last year, and I often tell people sixty is the new forty, or at least for me. <laughs> and I'm, I'm pleased to report that uh, in my day to day, notwithstanding the you know the ups and downs that it can come along, but you know, generally speaking. I'm I'm feeling quite good. I'm, I'm feeling um, in good health. Um, I'm uh, I'm not not as stressed. I feel grateful that I live down on the west coast of Victoria in the, uh, in the township of Torquay. Um, in Australia, for, for those who are not in Australia. Yeah, I've been uh, there for the last two and a half years with my lovely wife Connie, yeah, nice. and uh, and dog, and um, I, I feel very. Uh, fortunate and privileged to be living there, which allows me to escape from the city of Melbourne, which I commute to twice a week. But I'm, I am feeling in a good place, man. You know, I'm, I, I experience, um, you know, a lot of peace of mind these days, um, a great sense of purpose. I have, um, I, I tell people that I'm abundant in all the things that money can't buy, which is great physical, mental, emotional health. Mm. Um, I've got a, a beautiful wife who I love and she loves me. Um, um, I've got three kids and a stepdaughter and, and uh, we, you know, there's some issues with the oldest son, but that's another story. Mm. Um, but, but overall, it's the relationship I have with my children is way better uh, than what it was if we go back 15 years or so. Oh, that's, but again, that's good to hear. That's an ongoing, uh, that's an ongoing process uh, too. Mm. Um, you know, I love my work. I'm, I'm looking towards, um, I hate the, I hate to use this word, but I know it's very commonly used today it's to pivot into more of the speaking space. Um, you know, I, I have a studio in Brunswick, uh, been in the music industry for over 40 years and look, I've been lucky it served me well, but, uh, the way the industry is, is, and with AI and stuff, I, I can't see myself five years really doing this or much of this, so uh, I need to be doing something. And it's always been important to me that whatever I was to do for a living, here, it was something that I was passionate about, something that I enjoyed. Mm. And so speaking to groups of people is something I'm very passionate about and sharing a message of hope to others and connecting with people in, in, in the hope that um, you provide that pivotal moment for them because you were there in that moment to say something to them that shifted their thinking. And, you know, I've often described myself as, well, I hope, well, let's describe myself, but I, I hope to be is like a domino that creates just enough impact to create the chain reaction that I may never be there to see the outcome of that. But if it's enough to start it going, then I've done my job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what do you do for work then? Tell us about your business. What's, what's it called and what you do in mm-hmm. music and in the studio? Because some of the pictures I've got around here, you're clearly musical. You're into the studio. We can tell by where you're at now. Um, yeah. if, the, if, the, you know, if they can see it, some of the pictures up here, you've been, you know, I showed you before we started. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yes. they paint a picture, but you paint it a little bit further for us. Okay, so um, I'm what they call a mastering engineer. Uh, my business is called Deluxe Mastering, and um, the the simplest way of describing my work is I take other people's recordings and put it through a process to try and make it sound as good as possible, to optimise it, to make it balanced, to make it feel finished, so that then my client can then put it on the internet or transfer it over to vinyl, and it just sounds good, no matter where you play it, whether they play it in the car or on their phone, or on a you know on a big PA, no matter where it plays, it should play well. So I just make 
it's the, I guess, the framing of a sonic picture, if you will. Mm. So it's a final step in the process before people release their records. And um, and I've been um, in this place here. It'll be come April this year. It'll be 18 years. But uh, I've been freelancing. Uh, I've run my own business now since 1991. Um, but as I said, I've, I've dabbled in lots of different areas of the music industry since 1981 and, uh, and found uh, Mastering to be my uh, my calling if you will hmm. yeah what's your business called if i can ask it's called deluxe mastering Del- oh you did say that so i've got because i've got a picture here and i wanted to elaborate on it a little bit more i don't know if you can see it mm-hmm. talk about jack the bear yeah well, jack-, jack, the bear, uh, jack the bear is my brand it's a nickname that was given to me many many years ago by um inadvertently by a couple of drunks on the new york subway <laughs> um, and uh, essentially, uh, well, I'll try. And, I'll just try and keep it brief. But I was coming home from a party with a work colleague, a studio a guy that I'd met, and two drunks in the middle of an argument. And the first thing I remember hearing is, um, "Look!" They looked at each other, and he said, "Don't blame me. Blame Jack the Bear." And then he turned around and saw me and said, "There, yeah, talk to him." Oh, now. As a, as a youngster, I had no idea what this was about, uh, but my friend thought it was hilarious. And, and I said, what, what's so funny? He said, oh, Jack the Bear, man, they're, these two guys, they're, they're Canadians. And I said, how do you know? He said, oh, you'll pick up with the accent. And he said, um, these guys, um, I know this because I know people that work in lumber or timber. And apparently in amongst um, the the lumberjacks, if something goes wrong, you don't you, you, you blame Jack the Bear. So, if, you know, if a log hits a tree or a car, yeah, so don't blame me, blame Jack the Bear. So these guys were arguing about something and he was just saying, blame Jack the Bear. So he was trying to shift responsibility. And the irony is that in, in the line of work that I do, my job is to try and fix things and try and get things right for yeah. people. So um, if Jack the Bear is the uh, the patron saying they're getting things wrong and I'm doing something that's meant to be right, there was an irony. So, yeah. so my friend thought that was hilarious. He started calling me that. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big guy too. I'm, you know, six foot two and a bit. Um, solid build guy, and uh, he uh, thought that was hilarious and started uh, calling me that, so it uh, it kind of stuck. Yeah, made a business out of it. Yeah. I like it. How did that serve you? Pretty well? Well, I, I, I guess so. I mean, um, it, uh, I guess you can't rely just on a catchy name, although I do get, you know, I do often get comments that's a cool name and it's, uh, people people like it. And, um, you know, it's funny because people, my real name is Tony, yeah, um, mm. and I, one of the most common questions I get apart from how did Jack the Bear come about is, uh, do we call you Tony or Jack? <laughs> and uh, I, if if you yell, if, if I'm down the street and you're behind me and you, yell out and you yell, Jack, I'll turn around just as instinctively as I would if you called out Tony. Okay. But it's been with me for, yeah, uh, better, you know, almost 40 years now, so, yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, those subways in New York there definitely have some characters down them, don't they? Uh, yeah, it was uh, definitely uh, back in the eighties. Definitely uh, a, a different, but although I've, un- unfortunately um, I've been following a lot of the things happening in New York City right now, and and things aren't really good over there. So mm. I, um, I I don't think I particularly fancy wanting to uh, travel on the subway there these days, especially yeah. late at night. It, yeah, it, 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 when I started going to New York from 2000, it was definitely a lot better. People, oh, yes, was, yeah. you know, girls could walk around the streets at four o'clock in the morning, whereas in the 80s and the 90s, they, they could not do that, you know? Yeah, oh, look, the 80s was, uh, yeah, it was a horrific time. Mm-hmm. Um, it, was, it, was just, it was just really filthy until Walt Disney came in at Times Square and started cleaning it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I think when I go back to the post and what brought my attention to you was a few words that scared the living daylights out of me. If I'm going to, if I'm going to, you know, be open and honest about it, but I, obviously I knew it, 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 the, the words you chose to write were, were purposeful and you were clearly in a good space. Um, so how can I say it? The words I think what really stuck out to me that brought me to you because I loved the energy that came out in those words were 30 um, year, cocaine binge mm. can we can we go back now then to really yeah, sure. dive yeah. deep into into mm. n- yeah. not even talk about that just yet but maybe the root cause of it what, what spiraled for you when you were young uh well 
Unlike, um, I guess, most people that were addicted to drugs didn't wake up one day with um, the ambition that they were going to become drug addicts. Uh, Cocaine was uh, a drug that was introduced to me, all part of the music business. It was all fun and games. Mm. And... uh, and unfortunately for me, uh, I went down a slippery slope with it and it stopped becoming something social and fun into, uh, obviously I didn't realise it at the time, uh, but um, as I've learned about drug addiction, substance abuse addiction, this sort of stuff, it's a coping mechanism. Um, and so just over time, um, you got to a point where the drugs weren't becoming fun. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, they made me feel worse, but then you needed more to try and make you feel better from being feeling worse um and it's, as i said it's a slippery slope and um it's certainly uh certainly not glamorous that's for sure so did anything was it purely the the, the lifestyle of the music system uh, business or was it was there something yeah, look, that was, that was look, dark it, before it was, that it, it was it was it was it was just from that um mm-hmm. you know cocaine it was plentiful available cheap and um and there and you know when you're young and you're curious and you 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 you, you know you want to be a part of the gang and that's and this is what everyone else seems to be doing. Um, I, I'm going to get on board and particularly, excuse me, as a youngster who uh, never really felt I belonged anywhere and grew up very much like a loner. When uh, you feel like okay, you're in amongst a group of people, everyone's high, everyone's um, feeling good, everyone's feeling the love as it were, uh, you, you're feeling this sense of connection to people and uh, to somebody that uh, didn't have that as a youngster, that was so novel and so so cool and just I thought, wow, this is great. And, and so I just continued on doing that, not realising that, uh, how harmful it was going to be mm-hmm. for me and my health and my wellbeing and, and how it was going to impact on other people as well. Mm-hmm. And um, what about your childhood before? And it doesn't matter which order we kind of do it. In, no, I suppose. Okay. We'll, we'll just get. Uh, so, look, um, growing up as a child, I was. Um, I didn't. And I'm not going to say that I, I grew up under privilege or anything like that. I, I grew up in a family where I was well provided for. Um, I did have a. My father, however, was not very present because he was. He was a hard worker. He wanted to do the best that he could for his family and uh, didn't have um, him around. And also had my mum, who we found out much later in life, but it explains a lot now that she was, um, she'd suffered from schizophrenia. And so I'd uh, grown up with a mother who was very erratic in her behaviour. And as a youngster, you you, you feel quite helpless because you want to help, you want to try and make things good, um, but you don't know how. Uh, but also the unpredictability of her behaviour was also um, also had impact because some, sometimes you did something you're rewarded for and then you did the same thing and then you were punished for it. And so it was it, it really started treading on eggshells and feeling very insecure and unsafe. Um, as I said, my dad wasn't around. Um, so it, it was not it was not easy. Um, and again, I acknowledge that there are people that have way worse, uh, but. But it certainly impacted on me, and um, it, it certainly took a gave my self esteem quite a beating, and um, also having a dad who was constantly tired and angry, and obviously unresolved of his issues growing up, uh, and so projecting onto me, and you know I, I'm at a, you know today I'm at that point where I understand that and I forgave him for that, and and I get it. But it still had an impact and it impacted me for a very long period of time, probably more so than it needed to um, as well. So I certainly take some responsibility for allowing it to stay with me and for me to keep running my story around it and using being a victim and blaming my dad uh, mm. for, for way, way too long. I often tell people that I'm a late bloomer. A lot of things came much later to me, which is fine. Um, mm. I believe in the adage of better to be late to the party than a non-starter. Yeah. So, you know, childhood was um, it was also exacerbated by the fact that uh, um, my parents, uh, being of European extract and English was not um, my, my first language growing up as a kid. So going to school where not a lot of migrant kids um, were, and trying to deal with learning, which I struggled with learning. I went to school way too early, really. In hindsight, they should have sent me a year later, which is, which is you know, wise for most boys. They threw me to school when I was four. 
So learning, I always struggled with learning and as a result that made me feel like I was inadequate and not good enough and it just snowballed from there. So yeah. look, childhood wasn't yeah, fun, do, but it really can. You know, yeah. today yeah, as in I England, speak we can to go to school. I we have to go to school for five and and here. We can push it back a little bit, and I, I do see the difference yeah. uh, in that, and especially in young boys as well. Um, yeah. You mentioned your mum. What but, sort of erratic behaviours did your mum uh, go through her, herself personally through oh, the she, schizophrenia? She, she just she would just all of a sudden yeah. scream, and she'd talk to herself, and um, just act again, just um, because she. She was a schizophrenic and and had um, I guess multiple disability order and and she'd be you know she'd be talking to the to just to nobody mm-hmm. and 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 just completely losing her mind. Um, Where you know, did that from, come from? Um, well, my mum had a. I'm not going to go into too much de- detail about it, but um, my mother had a very traumatic childhood, and I think that was again just her inability to process what had happened to her. Yeah. Um, it's a shame. Trauma. I, to be honest, I didn't know. I didn't know that my mother was a schizophrenic until after her death. Yeah, I found that. I found this out later. Um, Normalized a... behavior for you, though, growing up, right? Because you don't know any different. That well, 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 well yeah, S- scary nonetheless. Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, you, you know, and and kind of having to become the the the, the man of the house, if you will. You know, mm-hmm. as a youngster, because uh, dad wasn't around, so I had to kind of step up and. In my own way, trying to look after her and just really not knowing how to do it. Um, mm. It's pretty scary when you're a little one. Yeah, definitely. And you, 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 you said your dad wasn't a, a, around, but when he was around, what type of relationship did you guys have? Um, dad was difficult to be around because he was always tired and angry. Um, as did I he, said, um, did he lash out to you guys being angry? Yeah, he'd, he'd, he'd lash out a lot, and he, dad felt really bad about himself because he never got to pursue his academic um, his academic dreams. He was smart enough and good enough to go, but life got in the way for him and didn't allow it. And so he thought, well, if I didn't, if I didn't do it, then my son will or my daughter will. And so mm-hmm. he spent um, all, you know, all of our lives basically living vicariously through us as a way to try to make up for what he never got to achieve. And so he thought that would be the next best thing. And given that I had, no interest in academia whatsoever. It was something that would really cause us to butt heads and um, wanting to get into music was something that he were frowned upon. He he could see it as a hobby and he his argument was, why don't you go to school, get a job, make good money, and then you can buy the records you want. He didn't understand that it wasn't about buying stereos and records as much as it was about I wanted to get into the creative process of making records. Mm. And he um, and he just saw the music industry as uh, not a good industry, not full of good people, sex, drugs, rock and roll, um, you know. And, and yes, that, that is an, an element of it, but it's, um, it, it, it's not the, uh, the, the cliche that people have been brought up with, you know. Mm. So, but that's what he knew. He, he, he did his best with what he knew. Uh, didn't quite execute that well mm. at the time. But as I said to you, and I'll probably keep repeating, despite what I've been through with him, um, I've, I've learned to become grateful for it because if it wasn't for my dad, you know, I've been asked before, so tell me if your dad was really supportive and let you leave school early and that would, do you think that would have been better? And the answer is I don't know and we mm. never will. We can only no. speculate. What I do know is that because of my dad's um, pushback that developed resilience in me and it, it thickened my hide and it made me more determined and having that quality today has served me well so if it wasn't for that so it, it's interesting how things happen to us that may not be good on the surface but if you look deep enough you can actually find a positive in these things too and if you choose to make things work in your favour, then they can. It's Again, it's a, it's the choice. It's like, am I going to allow this to control me, which I did for way too long, mm. or am I going to stop being a victim, take some responsibility and realise that it was these things that helped shape and formed who I am today into who, right now, into mm. the version of, you know, Tony, Jack, who you see right now. So I do know that. If it wasn't for that, there's no, you know, I, I wouldn't have developed those traits. Yeah. But at the same time, what impact did it have you on you at school? Because obviously you probably went to school, what, low confidence. You were obviously affected with your learning 
Well, uh, I, could, yeah, look, I, in that. look I, I, I hated school. I never liked authority. I, um, I, I just knew from a young age that I didn't know I wanted to do music when I was in primary school, but I, I just really wondered what's the point of all this. Um, I, I, I didn't necessarily like the, the structure. There was just something about school. Now, I understand it's necessary, and for people particularly that want to do um, something in the tertiary realm, academics, stuff like that, it's fine. But I, I, I just, I just went to school, and I just felt it was a waste of time, and and mm. and did the the barest minimum. But, um, but I did struggle learning. I did, I did struggle taking things in, um, and all I wanted to do was just get in and out as quick as I could. Did you struggle uh, socially with f- connection relationships? Yeah, 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 I did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Um, there was the there was a cultural difference, uh, and also because I was a pudgy kid as well, so I was picked and picked on and bullied as a as a young kid. So I was very very isolated. I mean, I had some friends, but I wasn't um, I wasn't a popular kid. Um, I did was you know didn't get involved. Well, not to many birthday parties. Uh, I, I I wasn't one of the cool kids. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. that's. That's. I mean, that that has major impacts. It doesn't make you want to get out of bed every morning, does it? That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and and, but that's what you know, school was a scary place, and mm. um, and unlike today where, you know, something goes wrong. Now I think we've sort of gone the other extreme. Now we're having mediation meetings and all this <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, but but back then it was a case of um, if you. If you were to go to teach and tell something would happen, the, the standard response was, you know, don't tell tales, just go work it out. Yeah, yeah you snitch. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, and you know, I, I think back then it, the, the pendulum was swinging a bit too far in one direction. I think today we've gone a little bit too far in the other direction. Yeah. Um, but but again, it was um, that that kind of thing just hardens you. It, you, you you've got no choice. It either's going to break you, or it, you have to learn to you know toughen up a bit through it. So, so when you left school, then when you left high school, where which direction did you go in? Uh, I mean, you were eighteen. You start. This is when the the beginning part yeah, of your uh, cocaine look, I, journey was. I, I wanted. I, I basically went over to America and went and did a studio tour. Um, I I knew that. Um, if I wanted to learn at the time, I didn't know what mastering was. That was this is why I often tell people mastering found me. But I knew I wanted to be a record producer because as a teenager, I used to collect records. I used to save my lunch money, bus money, and buy records. And one of my dear friends, Martin, you know, it's Martin Cook, who I met in um, 1977 uh, at high school, who uh, passed away. So God bless him. Um, he was one of the sort of, and, and he was one of these kids that was an outsider as well, and. Um, he introduced me to music and record collecting, and so you know we we formed a tight friendship over that, and and so I would be you know li- not just listening to the records, but you know reading the liner notes. This is vinyl back then, where the artwork was great, and and so I you know I'd read all the liner notes, and I would see all these names, and I thought you know I I want to I want to learn how to do that. I want to learn how to make records and create the magic. Mm. So uh, at the time in Australia, I mean, Australia did have an industry. There was a lot of great engineers, but all the engineers that I really admired were overseas. And so I uh, said, yeah, I'm just going to go and take trips and I'm going to travel and I'm going to knock on doors and I'm going to um, just watch and learn and do what I can. So I, I never did the classical apprenticeship that most of my peers would have done. It was really quite, quite, really quite unorthodox. Um, and interestingly, it also added to the reason I suffered from imposter syndrome for so many years, because mm-hmm. everyone else was going through the classical way of doing things, which was um, you, you got on the ground floor, you were sweeping floors, you were rolling out mic cables, you were just kind of just paying your dues that way. Whereas I just um, found out who the people I really admired were and went and knocked on their doors and um, just went in to watch as a visitor and observed. And I just learned so much just through observation and asking questions. Uh, until I got to a point where I, I think I can, I think I can make a go at this, and so I did. Uh, just again, just just through observation and and asking questions from lots of different people from lots of different studios over, the, you know, particularly through the eighties. How long did you feel like the imposter syndrome bothered you for? How how did you get through that? Uh, right, probably up until the last 
probably about five years ago. <laughs> oh wow! Okay, so yeah. how, what made you? What? How did you navigate that then? Um. Well, interestingly, it was through. Um, I was seeing a um, a counselor, therapist, call him what you will, um, and I, I basically told him that I felt that way because, again, I, I'm not a technical person, uh, not technical at all, unlike a lot of my other peers um, and colleagues. And because, of, again, the way I got into this was not through the traditional method, so I never really felt I was like one of the boys and um, that I was part of the fraternity. Um, and 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 also just still having a very low self sense of self esteem. Uh, I never felt I was good enough, and I, you know. And and I, and I guess I got through it after my uh, my therapist who sat me down, and he was like like a barrister who cross examines you about your thoughts around things and and uh he said well, you know how can you be an imposter when you've achieved this and you've done it this way and again when he when he sh helped to shift the perspective he helped me realize that I actually was an imposter and sometimes we we can conflate um humility with humiliation you know mm. um i know that especially in this country, tall poppy syndrome. We have tall poppy syndrome. People don't like to, you know, be get too big for their boots. Mm -hmm. People uh, trying to be, you know, level-headed and humble. But I, I think I I was going beyond humility to, to self-deprecation because um, still deep down I didn't, I didn't feel I was good enough. I, um, I, I was always following the narrative of my dad telling me that you'll amount to nothing um, and, and, and believe that and really took it on board. Um, but it was through that work with uh, this guy's name's Carlos, by the way. And I shout yeah. out to Carlos. Yeah, great guy. And uh, and so I would say five years ago, uh, I was able to see that, and more importantly, take ownership of that. And I remember I wrote a blog about it, uh, which got me oh my goodness, so much feedback. So many people just privately just saying, and and from people who were higher profile than me who were telling me, oh, my God, you're not going to believe uh, how that resonated with me and how I still feel this one. I'm going, you? Really? Yeah. You know? But as I said, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's important to remain humble and, it's, and have an understanding. There's always things to learn. But I think it's also equally as important to, A, recognise, acknowledge where you've been and also to accept compliments from people because I, I was just terrible at taking compliments and I would – I would always just um, tell people, yeah, of course, well, of course you're going to say that. What else are you going to say? And, and sometimes being a bit rude. And, and, um, and the way I got about that was to be reminded that compliments, giving compliments is like giving a gift. And, and I was challenged on that. And I said, well, tell me, every time you give a compliment, are you, um, are you being fake? Are you just saying it for the sake of it? Go, no. That's all. What makes you so special to think that other people don't feel the same way? You know, you wouldn't want to have your compliment rejected, right? So why would you reject theirs? Uh, and, and that was that was quite a moment to to take that on board because um, there was so much truth in it. And so I uh, I became I started becoming better at uh, just being able to say thank you and, uh, and and moving on. Yeah, I mean that's a prime example, isn't it? To prove to the point that you know. It's I think behind the scenes, even those really confident people who are outgoing and have got amazing things going on, um, there's a lot of imposter syndrome where people are actually really quite insecure about themselves, but you would never in a million years think it. Um, so I always try and sit back when I see somebody doing really well, doing a speech up there, or they, they just look amazing. And I, I always used to think, I could never do that because of the imposter syndrome. But they're probably suffering with the same thing, but doing it. In a way, I kind of feel like that now with this. Because um, like you, I have had some people say, mm, what are you doing that for? You know, and mm. uh, some people have given the compliments and I've taken them on board. Um, but I think some people do think it's about me doing this. No, this is not about me. It, I, I've tried to connect all my purposes together. You know, people have always made jokes. That I love to talk. I love to talk. Mm. I love to connect. And I try to think with everything that I went through, with creating the book and the trauma before that, I thought, how could I put all of these things together, but put good into the world? Yep. I love because, it. Yeah. Cause my perception as I think of the book and this could be paranoia. I think some people who knew my journey probably thought that was 
all anger. Yeah. And you know what? There probably was 10% of anger and frustration behind the book for sure of mm -hmm. why I got it out there, but it wasn't the be all and end all of it. No. And I think, yeah, I wanted to put all of those traits together, talking, connecting with people, putting good stories into the world so people can learn from people like yourself mm -hmm. and the other guests that I've been lucky enough to have on the show. Um, I'm just getting that goodness out into the world. Mm -hmm. I just think so many people can learn from it. Um, you know, um, well, well, yes, I'm doing it, but you know yeah well one thing I've, I've been saying for a long time now um andy is that haters are confused admirers for the most part yeah and quite often the people that will question you i'm, I'm sure they mean well um but usually people who will um um criticize you for lack of a better word or, or question you usually aren't doing as well as you are and well, and, and that's been an amazing thing for me. I, I noticed, um, particularly when I when I got rid of my excess weight, I, I thought people would be happy for me. And, and I guess they were in their own way, but they also started to behave a bit differently uh, mm -hmm. to me as well because they, they'd lost uh, a different version. And because I had changed and transformed and uh, I, I was... Uh, a lot more confident, a lot more outgoing. I'd speak up more, mm. and and so all of a sudden I wasn't becoming the butt of the jokes and the funny fat guy and mm. and whatnot. And so they were, in their own weird way, grieving a loss. And um, and as I started to be less and less around them, uh, they they were losing me. In fact, you know, and 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 so they were resorting to this behaviour because. They were. They were grieving. They were grieving the old version of me, and and uh, mm. and and so it's interesting how when you go through transformation and change, whatever that may be, that some people won't necessarily be happy about it, and it's not always because of nefarious reasons, but it's because they the weird way they love you, and the, but they're losing the version of you that served them, yeah. and once you don't serve them or their needs anymore, all of a sudden, you know. People don't like change, right? People, especially big, big change. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was so a very true. interesting observation I found with people um, over the years. Yeah, so true. And you, you, you brought something before that um, kind of triggered my thoughts a little bit. You, you, I, people on in outside of Australia have probably never heard of that tall poppy syndrome. Uh, cut the tall poppy down because funny you bring it up because in that book, chapter one, and I, I don't want to plug my own book, but it, it does connect to your statement chapter one we collected uh, bully type scenarios from around the world from people from all different types of industries and um, mine i i called it tall poppy i, I didn't, wasn't going to tell anybody that i wanted people to figure that out for themselves especially the people that knew but who cares mine in there is called toppy tall poppy and mm -hmm. um, i called it that because after the the, the bullying at work kind of moved on and kind of came out of it even though it's a whole new journey for me after that with paranoia and anxiety and and you know and so on i um realized you know i was on a uplift with my career i was doing well I was confident outgoing certainly didn't want to stand on anyone's toes i won I, I, and i'm not saying it because i want people to know but i won the national teacher of the year award here in australia and i think that's when the bullying started after that and i think people just i don't know i hated it when people brought it up actually but the jokes kind of went on for a bit longer than probably they should have done and you know mm -hmm. uh, and and people somebody said to me you know they're trying to cut you down they're trying to it's the tall poppy cut the tall mm -hmm. poppy i was like what what does that mean yeah. and, and they explained it i was like wow and um it seems to be a, a resonating thing here in australia i don't remember hearing it in england so mm -hmm. everyone everyone loves you everyone loves you kind of when you're on the way up but once you sort of get to that point and now you 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 you, you out of reach of people you start achieving things and you start uh, doing things outside of that group dynamic, mm. um, um, that's where envy comes into it. And so, and rather than people being happy for you, they just don't really quite know how to express themselves and how to deal with it because, as I said, the, the dynamic has changed and mm. they probably more often than not will see things about you that they wish they had or they'd like to be able to do, but they haven't for whatever reason. And so um, yeah. it, it's it's always easier to uh to just poke fun at it and belittle it and trivialize it than it is to say yeah that's great you know, mm -hmm. well done you know, what yeah. did you do you know how did, what did you do in so that maybe i can also get a similar res 
result in whatever that area of life may be. Yeah, you know, during that same time of my trauma, I or beginning of the trauma, I, I, I definitely felt like an imposter myself. Uh, I was working with these amazing teachers and I'd come from teaching high school in England to teaching the little preppies here in Australia. I had no idea what I was doing. But, you know, I, I turned up to smi- every day with a smile, talking to these, everybody, um, you know, the parents, the kids. I just wanted to connect and, you know, make friends. I know not everybody goes to work to make friends, but when you spend most of your week with colleagues you what's the harm in making friends I, it's not that we need to go to dinner every single night but damn just get along with people i mean these guys were amazing and um, i took pieces of these guys and put it into my own flair and um you know yeah just <laughs> but yeah so i don't know I, i'm kind of going off topic i suppose and, and you know it's caused a little bit but i was definitely uh, an imposter for sure whilst i was there teaching those little previews i but didn't you know what, a clue what day, i was doing at the end of the day for an honest andy we're all just winging it mate we're all just Top, winging yeah. it. yeah <laughs> yeah so with did you thrive on that imposter because it lasted like you said until about five years ago do you think the imposter syndrome was the it, it, it actually uh, benefited you in some way um I don't know if it benefited me um, because it went beyond just being humble. Yeah, right? okay. Um, it was it was just me just beating up on myself, um, and and so it it really did hold me back uh, mm. more than it needed to. Um, so no, I wouldn't say it necessarily served me well. Okay. but I'm glad I'm through it. That's for sure. Yeah. So this time in America, going through uh, moving on. How long were you in America for? Or was it well, snippets? I, 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 was, I was coming and going through um, through, through the eighties, um, hmm. and I spent some time in Canada as well, a couple of years there, um, and 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 that was fun. Um, it was it was a good education, man, because I got to I got to see lots of different studios, got to meet lots of different engineers, got to get a, a, a really wide spectrum of of things of how to do things. And as I said, it was. Um, it was where I discovered mastering because I didn't know what the heck that was before I went overseas. And when I came across it, it just resonated with me because uh, you know, mastering is, and even to this day, it, it's it's not a glamorous part of the industry. It still doesn't have the same prestige and profile as being a producer or a mix engineer. Um, but I wanted to get into this because it was love of music and just wanted to make a career from music. I didn't want to be a rock star, didn't care to be famous. I wanted to be pragmatic and mastering was the gateway for me to get into something that I could learn relatively quickly and maybe make a niche for myself with it. So, and and I'm grateful for it because I think if I tried to hustle with everyone else trying to get a position as an in-house engineer or um, it it would have taken longer and, uh, and it it would have uh, cost me more money and, and, Goodness knows if I ever really would have been able to stand out, but doing this it created a niche, and a lot of people weren't doing it. So I was able to establish myself and and create a business around it that um, you know still serves me today, albeit in much more challenging times. Mm. Okay, so let's dive deeper into um, the thirty year period of of the drugs. Um, mm-hmm. What where was the darkness in all of this? What low? What real lows? Did you, I mean, did you go through any lows? Uh, with it, depression, psychologists. It was a series of lows uh, through, you know, it was up, ups, ups and downs. But I, but I, for the vast majority of that time, I, I felt very isolated. I felt very alone. Even though I was a social person, I still suffered a lot of social anxiety. And I, I think I always lived with a cloud over my head that I wasn't good enough. I was going to amount to nothing. Uh, even doing this, I was never going to get good at it. I would never be successful at it. I, 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 I just, you know, when I think about it, wow, I, I ran a, a hell of a race with a ball and chain around my, my ankle. Um, but, you know, again, I think the the main thing for me was about validation and approval of my dad. It was all, yeah. it was, everything was really came down to that. And, and others as well, of course, but... Mm. Not having my dad's approval um, was something that, and and I knew that with what I was doing in my life, it was never going to be there. He he never, he he just never particularly liked the career path I'd chosen. 
never, um, no matter what I did, you know, whether I got gold records or anything like that, platinum records, uh, no matter how much success I was having in building my studio, um, it it wasn't. He didn't completely dismiss it, but 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 he never ever really said, you know, geez, I'm really proud of your son because that was the last thing he wanted for me. And because I didn't go down the academic route, as far as he was concerned, there was nothing I could do that was going to make up for that or make him feel like that he achieved something as a dad. I think he always saw it as his failing as well as mine. Mm. So as far as he was concerned, the horse had bolted. There was no, there was no redemption, no, 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 nothing. And I guess what made it worse that was that he'd always would compare me to other kids that you know from other fam, other families that we knew that went on to university and do all that. And he would always say, you know, why can't you be like so and so? You know, why can't you be like them? Oh, geez, I'm a failure. I'm a failure. So my dad would even always in front of me would tell me that he failed as a father and that. He he never you know I, I I didn't I didn't raise you know two kids to be proud of I'm ashamed of you kids um, you know I, I I don't know how to hold my head up in public with other people when I see how their kids are at union doing well and doing and getting married and whatnot and so which which leads me to um, one interesting part of my life that I have I've spoken a little bit about but I'll, I'll I'll get into it here. But this is to show you what I was prepared to do to try and get my dad's approval, which is um, I I got married to a, a, a woman who I was not not really in love with, but I thought if I can get married and have kids, then that would kind of make up for things because at least I did that, you know, because my dad thought, you know, you know, getting married, having kids, all that stuff. So um, as it turned out, the woman that I married, he liked her, but... He didn't really think all that much of her. I remember, I remember the first time I, <laughs> I introduced. I can laugh about it now, you know. Um, but I introduced the first time I introduced. I said, "Hey, Dad, you know this is. I, want, I don't want to name her name." Um, and the first thing he said was, a "Bit short for you, isn't she, son?" <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so as I said, not, nothing was ever going to be good enough, and I and and that's what really sent me down the big slippery slope. Because you know, after you have married and have kids, and that doesn't quite make it in your dad's book to make him feel really proud of you and feel validated. Um, that's that's when it, that's when life really went down a real slippery slope. So I thought, okay, I've made my bed, I've got to lie in it. Um, the, I've, I've shot all my shots. There's nothing else. That's it. That's that's the end. And and that's when things really really went downhill. Um, uh, and you know, in terms of lots more drug use, to just because again, I was just I was in constant, constantly feeling sad and in pain, uh, presenting a great veneer to the world. Um, uh, but because a lot of my drug use, I mean, while I was socially, I was doing drugs socially in amongst you know the people I was hanging out with and what have you, but. But I was just seen as a social person. But you know, then I'd have to go and hide behind the scenes and you know do a lot of drugs by myself. Uh, there's a lot of guilt and shame that goes on when it comes to um, substance abuse, and so I, I, I carried a lot of guilt and shame around that. You know, feeling ashamed that I really shouldn't be doing this, knowing that it wasn't right. It was um, you know costing me a lot of money um, and really getting me nowhere uh, uh, with in terms of trying to get that sense of feeling approved. Uh, you know, you can't, you know, don't underestimate how important um, all children, but if we're talking, if we're just going to talk, you know, just specifically about the father-son dynamic, uh, every son wants to be approved by their dad because your dad's your world, right? He's everything. Um, you you pedestalise him. And when you don't, you don't get that, uh, then from him, uh, then, you know, then the message you get uh, is that I'm I'm not good enough. I never will be good enough, and it doesn't matter what anyone else will say. Because again, people would say, "Oh, you know, you, oh, you're great, man." You, you know, people would always be complimentary and and and, and lovely, but it, it it just didn't matter. I just uh, just couldn't take it on board. Um, so uh, so yes, that was the uh, and 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 look again, like with a lot of things in my life, when I fast forward today, um, I learned a lot of lessons from my marriage, and I I have a lot of respect for my ex-wife. She birthed three children for me, 
And and I think the biggest lesson out of all of that really was the fact that um, validation is something that you give yourself. It's nice to be approved, and it's a you know it's a need to belong and to be accepted, and but it's so disempowering because then you leave yourself to the whim of others uh, as, and to their opinion, that just becomes a mental prison you never get out of. And so, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, if I, in the same way that I didn't care what, I didn't care about what my dad thought when I would just, you know, go overseas to learn things and not go to, you know, university and whatnot, I should have adopted the same attitude with the other stuff. And as I, and as I did and learned how, to back myself and not be dependent upon the opinion of others, that freed my, my life quite extensively. Uh, you know, we, we live in this interesting irony, and especially in the world of social media, where people are on one side of the fence looking over at other people and, and worrying about what they may be thinking about them, but the, the reality is those same people are looking at you, worrying about what you're thinking about them. <laughs> it's really quite absurd. But it's very, very true. And, and, and the minute you realise that and accept that, um, you can actually start living your life um, not beholden to the wishes of others. And I, I know that certainly that's one thing that a lot of people regret when they get to their closing stages of life, that uh, you know they wish they'd lived their life on their terms according to their wishes and not in accordance to what other people thought it needed to be. Yeah. Have, have you... Have you seen that shift since social media's become more prevalent? Because obviously you've always been in front of the screen. I know there's not much of a connection there, but uh, have you seen that that difference in in people's oh, behaviour? Well, ab- ab- oh, well uh, oh, ab- absolutely. I mean, you 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 can see it how um, how much narcissism there is online, and 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 people wanting to project. Everyone's trying to put their best foot forward, and you know, with the advent of filters and whatnot, you know, whether it's people slightly exaggerating something to completely fabricating it still because it's hard for people to, 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 you know, disprove you otherwise, you know, because you're creating your own reality. And so because everyone else seems to be doing it, nobody wants to seem like they're behind or, or, you know, they're, they're, they're better than. Um, and so they resort to these behaviors thinking incorrectly that people care and people don't really care. Mm. They, 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 if, if anything, they probably, if they believe your, um, you know, your your story, they probably actually feel worse because now there's jealousy, and I was like, mm, mm, you know, so I'm, I'm not going to say you know social media is a terrible, terrible thing. I think social media has its place and it's served me well too in many ways, but mm. but I fell victim to it too, you know, especially in the early stages of it, where I'd see things and I would and I never stop to wonder. Hang on a minute, how accurate is this? Is, is this just a bit of an embellishment, are they gilding the lily, or um, or is it just? But of course, most people don't think that. They just see it for what it is, and just again, uh, the, the dangerous, um, the dangerous thing of you comparing yourself to others, not understanding context or what the reality is, and so you uh, you then try to put yourself on, hold yourself to an account that's probably unattainable, and 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 that's anything, whether it's you know career, how you look. Um, all that kind of stuff. It's uh, that aspect of things, especially to the younger kids today. Uh, I can see that it's it's having a terrible impact. I, I, I think I saw somewhere today that eighty um, percent of Gen Z kids have at least one, if not more, psychological emotional disorders of some description. Um, a lot of them are medicated you know, to some degree. Mm. It's uh, it's a real sad state of affairs. Yeah, it certainly is. I agree. Do we, so you just mentioned medication, uh, connecting to you, do you, through all your time, your journey of drug related activities and depression and whatnot, did you have to take anything to, to get you through? What was your uh, path yeah, of remedy? Was, I, I was, I've had, uh, I've, I've been in and out of, um, of, um, you know, SSRIs of, you know, um, yeah, pills for depression, pills for anxiety, pills to sleep. Um, you know, went through just different periods of time when I needed it more than any other time. Um, you know, trying to you know go through therapy to deal with the drugs, but I think there was also a part of me that didn't really want to give them up because uh, I was afraid of what. First of all, I just didn't think there was any hope that I could, and 
but also just just fearful of you know what was life going to be like without them because even though they weren't serving me and and I wasn't feeling good on them particularly you know later on in the piece um and logically I knew that this wasn't good you know people do strange things that they know aren't good for them but they're familiar and we we are as much as we like the idea of change we we're afraid of change because, again, the fear of the unknown. Well, what's this going to present? How's life going to be? Will I be as, you know, will I be as funny if, uh, on, if I don't take drugs? Will I uh, be as creative if I'm not on drugs? Uh, and, and it throws up all these questions. And so you, it becomes a, a coping mechanism, a way to soothe your pain, uh, but also so much of your identity is wrapped up around it. Uh, and so, yeah, um, I think it's fair to say that that, you know, again, I was conflicted because there was the part of me that wanted to get off and knew I needed to get off, but the other part that kind of said, well, this is scary, this is too much. And as much as I don't like the feeling, at least I know it and uh, it's familiar to me and and I can deal with this even on the really, really bad days. It, 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 that to me was a, the lesser of two evils in my mind and I think a lot of people that do drugs and have issues trying to get off substances um, have that. There's a, there's the fear of what lies ahead as much as they know that intellectually, cognitively, they know it's going to be better for them. Logically, they know that, but there's still that part that's just uh, too scary to let go of. So do you think the antidepressants worked? I mean, I feel like you've already answered it, but... Uh, no, not really. I think in some, I, I, I think maybe temporarily, but um, as I discovered later, um, again, each to their own, but I, I, I think that antidepressants are probably the, the worst thing people could take. Um, again, I, I, I'm not a doctor and I'm not giving medical advice, but um, as I've learned, as I became more interested in health and wanting to learn more, um, that a lot of serotonin comes from your gut and it's gut health and, you know, and, and you know, people are not depressed as much as they may be living a depressing life or are in an environment that, that, that caused them to be that way and their diet doesn't support them. And so, you know, we, we live in a society now where, where, you know, the medical profession is very quick to want to prescribe because again, there's, there's, there's money and inducements, um, rather than look at things more on a holistic level because, well, for one, there's no money in cures. I mean, ph big pharma aren't interested in you being healthy. They're, they're interested in managing your condition for as long as possible. And, and you know, and, 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 and doctors, you know, as I said, they get inducements and whatnot and um, a lot. Oh, looking at the know, prevention side yeah, of things. Yeah, look, look, I've spoken to a lot of doctors over the years and, and, and they all tell me it's, 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 that they, they get no nutritional training at school, hardly ever. Yeah. Um, and My dumb friend's a doctor. He said the same thing, yeah. Yeah, you know. So, look, and as I said, I, I, I say this knowing that I'm not a doctor, I'm not here to dispense advice, but no. uh, to answer your question, no. They, in the long term, they didn't really. In fact, I think they probably made things worse, and especially when you use them alongside still using drugs as well. Mm. Um, yeah, it... Uh, it, it doesn't help your course, let me tell you. I don't recommend it. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're not doctors and we're certainly not giving advice. This, you know, this is solely on your journey, whether you think they worked. And I'm sure they have worked for some people. Um, but, you know, again, going back to what you said, the abbreviation, they're known as SSRIs, which is what? Suppressant serotonin reopen Receptive inhibitor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that is the definition. You're not supposed to ration serotonin. You're supposed to let serotonin re be released. 95% of it comes from the gut. Like you said, I think it's only 5% that actually comes out yeah. in the yeah. brain. Um, so, you know, if, you re if you're going back to the core issues, again, I'm not a doctor, but my research and the readings, the literature that I've come from and speaking to certain people is, you know, the better the foods that we eat, um, you know, tryptophan being an amino, amino acid releases serotonin, it methylates mm. into serotonin, releases mm. into the gut. Mm. So mm. let's go back to the core issues of where we can make these changes. But yeah, I mean, I think you're, I think you're clinically diagnosed as depressed of mm. um, not having a, a percentage, and I don't know what that is, of a lack of serotonin being released from the body. Mm. Yeah. So why would we want to ration it? It doesn't yeah. make any sense to me. Yeah, no, 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 ab 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 absolutely. But like I said before, look, you know, for some people it works and, and, and as a temporary mm. measure it may be yeah. okay. But um, I'm a great believer that so much of our ailments 
uh, are you know preventable, and a, a lot of it come down from diet and mindset. Uh, mm. Even when I got rid of all my weight, um, one great lesson that I share with people um, is I say you, you you will not achieve and maintain a fit body with a fat personality. And what I mean by that is your sense of identity as to who you think you are. If you you know cause this is why people yo yo a lot, uh, Andy, because they they love the idea that oh I've lost weight, I look great in these jeans, I look good in this dress. But subconsciously, because you haven't adopted of an identity of being a, a healthy, vibrant person, um, there's some, you're conflicted because you like what you see, but something tells you I'm not worthy of this, I'm not good. And there's a lot of, again, like with drugs, um, obesity, um, deep lying, emotional issues that have been unresolved. Food, is, to me, food is no different than using a drug to cope with, with things. Yeah. And so un- until you get down to the ticks and tacks of dealing with that stuff and – it, it's it's not easy, you know. You got to face demons. You got to do a lot of hard work, but it's it's a non negotiable part of the journey. And again, a, a lot of people like the idea of change, but once they realise what's involved, and if they do make a start and they see how hard it is, and it is hard, I'm not going to lie. No, no. Whether it's you're trying to kick drugs, trying to get rid of excess weight, um, trying to you know um, reclaim yourself as self esteem, uh, mm. the process of change is not easy, and and you know, change or more long-lasting change to the point comes with two ingredients, and that's time and effort. Mm. And and that's something that a lot of people aren't prepared to do. Well, certainly not to the extent that they need to in order to bring about um, – because it's not just about the change, Andy. It's about creating a habit because we're yes. creatures of habit. We're running unconsciously so much of the day. And so – you know, you, you need to you need to start thinking a certain way that I'm not a drug addict. I'm and and, and I'm not this way um, because you, you don't. You, after a while, you got to stop. And it's, this is not a fake it till you make it. This, this is mm-hmm. really just consciously um, recreating a new sense of yourself. Because when you think, okay, well, I'm I'm a, I'm a fit and vibrant person, even though I may not be right now, but. When you think that, you've got to think, okay, well, how does a fit and vibrant person operate in the world? What do they eat? Uh, what what are their habits? Who are the, pe- who are the people they hang around with? How do they um, sleep even? Yeah, all that kind of stuff, mm. you know? Uh, so change is not easy. Change is no, not easy. I agree, but... and I think people stumble because they, they see the big change they actually need to make, and that's too hard. Whereas if they learn to just, I mean, it's in this book, a, a friend of mine wrote this book here, New Year Better You, and he talks about, and I, something I've been um, related, relating to for quite a while, is making, that was what my change was, making a 1% change opposed to a 40% change. And then those 1%, so if you chip away at that week, whether it's daily, whether it's weekly, whether it's monthly, if you can make those small changes, they become normalized. Then you can make yeah. that same percentage of change again mm. and keep lifting. Before you know it, that you might have reached that 50% change within mm. a year, but you fall in love of how you feel at the end mm. of the day or after your morning routine or whatever it may be. Mm. Um, you fall in love with how, whether it's clarity, brain brain fog, moving on, um, you know, you've not touched a drug for a day, a week, a month, and that result of feeling like that from those mm. small changes, mm. you fall in love with it so much, you go, ah, I actually can do it. I think it's just that mindset, isn't it? They see the big change they merely make. They don't realize the little things to get scaffold the changes. Yeah. And they go, boom, I can't do it. It's too big of a change. They, I don't know how that person did it over there. But and, it's too much. Yeah, wherever you, wherever may, anyone may end up today, if they're watching or listening, um, mm-hmm. and they're not entirely happy with the circumstances around their life, it was a process that that brought you here. Just through, it was just a matter of, of making certain decisions that gave you certain outcomes. And mm-hmm. over time, here he you are, find yourself right now. And and so, you know, you need to reverse engineer that. Now, I'm not saying that it's going to take you 20 years to. To, to change it, but it but it's going to take small steps yeah. uh, that are manageable, but still challenging enough to to take you out of your comfort zone, and yeah. because you, you you have to go through that level of discomfort. I'm yeah. I you know you sometimes I've heard people say, oh, you got to embrace this. Look, I'm not going to say, oh, I just love discomfort, but but when I know that I'm going to go through something difficult, I do know that. It's actually going to do me good, and I still don't enjoy it. And there are days I don't want to go to the gym, and I just mm-hmm. don't feel like it. And but I just have to keep reminding myself that um, how better I'm going to feel after I'm done, not just from the mental challenge of overcoming that feeling, but knowing that hey, that feeling's waiting for you. So you know what you need to do to get there. So just go on there and get it done. Yeah, completely agree. 
Yeah, I, 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 I jump in cold water every morning and I didn't do it for a week uh, on purpose. Well, partly on purpose. I'm, I'm lying to myself. Partly on purpose, partly because I would... I need. I felt like my sleep was really lacking because of my routine with the summer break and not working through the summer. Um, and today was the first time I jumped in the cold water for a week, but it brought that sh- that, that feeling back of how I felt before. But that week, and it was a good good an assessment really because when I didn't jump in it, I was actually sluggish most of the day. I wasn't as present, and I I know, I, know, I I mean I knew it was good for me, but this is really seg- segmented. It really concreted yeah. Yeah. how these little habits. Um, make me feel for the rest of the day and you know um, dealing with the little things that you really struggle with kind of just roll off your back whereas before I probably would have lost sleep over or dwelled over or Mm. you know uh, going back to the food thing you mentioned it before I've never I've never I've never touched drugs not and I've had friends who've done them no no judgment whatsoever I've never gone down that road well, you you know what consider yourself fortunate my friend that you dodged that bullet you've uh, you uh, I, I I think I would I would love to be able to say that, but good, good for you. Yeah, no, and yeah. and I don't want that to come across, uh, you know, as a judgment because it's certainly, no, no, certainly no, no, not. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted for you, and anyone who has managed to do that, more power to you. It's uh, mm. um, I, way better off for for not having uh, dabbled in it or certainly gone down a, a slippery slope with it. I did go down the suicide route though, um, which I've only ever been really open, maybe about two years about it, really. Um, and again, I didn't go to the, the edge of the cliff to do it. It was probably mm-hmm. more the strategy, the two stages before, to, like thinking about what would people be like if I wasn't here? Would you, can I just end that, the, the thoughts that are running through my head? I can't seem to escape the thoughts, even though I had some amazing things, you know, kids and a nice house, a new car. And I, did, I had a dream job at the time. It just wasn't enough because I wasn't, I realized deep down I wasn't happy with myself. Mm-hmm. I wasn't clear. I was brain fogged and... Yeah, I did consum. I did it again. Not that I was going to do it, but it entered the thought entered my head. Yeah. If that I, makes I, sense, I, I don't think on anyone who, if they're honest, haven't contemplated it. And some obviously can think of it more often and more deeply and more seriously. And I certainly had my you know, moments with it too. Mm. Um, so uh, I, I think that is something that most people will contemplate, think about, maybe even attempt, even, yeah. even if it's a bit half-hearted. But um, yeah. But, I'm glad that you're still here with us, mate. Mate, me too, and I'm the clearest. I feel like of the clearest I've ever been. And but food was my downfall. I, I, I'm naturally a really skinny guy, but I put on a lot of stress, and cortisol obviously came out in the belly. You know, at night I'd be. I know here in Australia you can get these big blocks, relatively cheap, and I would be eating one of those a night. A packet of chips, you know, crisp that I call from England. You know, I'd eat, and they're not small packets here. They're they're big packets, and I'd, I'd eat one of those a night. Bag of mm. chips. Mm-hmm. glass of coke every night so my sleep was affected i was i'd go back to england and people would actually comment and say oh getting a bit of a tub there in your old age and mm-hmm. oh yeah in my head i'm like put blame it on old age but no 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 it's not nothing to do with old age it's my habits it's my yeah. snapshot of where i'm at now and you know in the last year i started to make those changes so that leads on to you how did you lose the, the your weight well um at, i think i was 47 at the time, mm-hmm. um, going to see my doctor and he, he took some blood tests and he sat me down and he said, these are the worst, these are the worst re- test results I've ever come across. And he said, mate, he said, I don't want to scare you. He said, but you're not, if, if you, I don't know what's going on, but if you keep doing what you're doing, you won't see 50, you won't see your kids grow up. And, and that was the, I don't know, you know the, the, the turning point, if you will, to, you know, um, to, to, you know, to get rid of weight. And, and, and then that, you know, took me towards seeing a life coach to try and get my act together. And, and, and so over time I started you know, getting rid of the weight and getting to the, you know, the nitty gritty of uh, what was driving that. Um, what was and, the nitty gritty? And the, pardon me? What was the nitty gritty? Well, again, just not feeling, not feeling worthy, not feeling good about myself. Uh, okay, the fact yeah. that um, my dad was never going to give my approval. I was in a marriage that I was stuck in. Yeah, I see. What I'd you're just saying. given up. I just basically gave up, and yeah, uh, I, I, the, the, I just didn't see any hope or any light at the end of the tunnel. And so, what was the point uh, yeah. of it all? Um, so, was so, it the food that you changed initially? Then, pardon me. Was it the food and the, and 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 Coming off the drugs it, that changed for was, you. Well, the, the drugs came later. I got off the drugs later. The the, the food was really um, about uh, yeah, just getting to the to the to the bottom of things and um, feeling bad about you know and and 
what it led to was me having to leave my marriage because I knew that being in that marriage was not good. It wasn't good, for, not just for me, mm. but it also wasn't good for my ex-wife either um, and not for my kids. And so, again, I, I knew I had to leave, but I didn't because I was worried about how much is this, how much is this going to cost me, what are people going to say. You know, I'm a man. I've made my bed. I've got a line. i just got to basically swallow it. But seeing as it was starting to affect my health that badly, um, I, I knew that I was always going to be miserable and unhappy uh, in the marriage, as indeed was my ex-wife. And as I started to lose the weight and started getting my mojo back, I, I realised I made the decision that I had to leave. Um, and, and yeah, it, it was not easy at all because um, my ex-wife, um, she did nothing wrong in all of this. You know, she got involved and got married because she believed in the marriage and was, uh, you know, was a great wife, great mother. And and I really, I was the one that did the wrong thing by her, and you know, carried a lot of guilt around in that too. Uh, so. But yeah, but anyway, it started with the food and then my mindset and then realising that I'd effectively been living a lie because it was all about everything I'd done was really uh, around getting my dad's approval mm. uh, and realising that that was just a complete waste of time because it was never forthcoming. It never came. Uh, and again, the, the, the sad truth and the bitter pill that validation is something that you give yourself and when you stop chasing it, interestingly, ironically, it comes to you quite organically. It just comes, you know, because you're not, you're not searching for it. You're not trying to make it fit. You're not trying to force it uh, in any kind of way. So, um, yeah, um, so a bit late in life, but we, we got there. Yeah, you did. And, and like, it, like what you said to before me, to what you said to me before, ditto, man. Glad you made those changes and that you're walking on the beach at Torquay, man. Because uh, I love your, I love your little motivational speeches that you do on the beach. Uh, what a setting to do it on. I mean, I will touch on that shortly, but just yeah. going back to the food, do you think, so really for me, I, the message that I'm getting is food was the catalyst in order to change, I suppose, that release of serotonin, release of uh, feeling normal again, mm -hmm. uh, which ignited everything else to get back on track from, sure. you know, in, in your head, I suppose. Yeah, you'll uh, you'll never outrun or outtrain a bad diet. I don't I know, care what anybody says. And, um, and, and once you change your relationship to food, and yeah, food can be for pleasure, and I still enjoy food and enjoy the moments so I'm going to have food, but mm. um, it's, it's that thing that you just always look forward to, because you know, food's such a big part of culture, right? And so it, everything we do is celebrate, or if we're commiserating, we'll mm. eat food to make ourselves feel better about situations. So um, once I learned that um, food is nutrition mm -hmm. and food is fuel for my body, um, uh, my relationship with it changed. But as I said, it, it was the diet, but also the overhaul of the mindset of my uh, attitude about myself, about understanding why I'd become so much of a food addict as well. Yeah. You know, why, why I was using food. Uh, again, coping mechanism, crutch, comfort. All yeah. that kind of stuff. And do you, what's your thoughts on, whilst we're on the subject, I know we're, we're probably going down the medic, medical routes here, but what's your thoughts on sugar and all of that? Sugar's uh, the most addictive. It's as addictive as cocaine. works in the same part of your brain. Um, yeah, I agree. I, I used to be a real sweet tooth, not anymore. Mm. Um, do you still uh, have sugar to some extent? Um, the only sugar I have is, okay, I'll have some berries. Okay, I... I, these days, I in the last nine, nearly ten months now, I've, I've become a, a, a carnivore. So I basically just eat meat right. and animal products, and have the odd bit of berries every now and again for a bit of sweetness or a bit of, little raw honey in my coffee. Mm -hmm. um, again, I don't want to demonise. Um, I don't want to demonise sugar. It, 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 um, again, it's uh, it's it's up to the individual, but I know that sugar and how much you know and you think about look at food how much sugar hidden sugar there is on everything is yeah. it no wonder that you know i mean again the big food companies they, they know what they're doing they got their um scientists in there you know how do we make this thing salty and sweet and delicious mm. and addictive because again it's about um trying to sell more stuff and make it on mass so it's cheap and available you know you mm. go in a supermarket and just see where all the all the rubbish is it's right there ready right prime time locations mm. for you to uh, to get and then how much money and marketing and advertising you know towards pushing these kind of foods um mm. so um yeah 
Food is where it's at. You know, I forget the. I think maybe it was Socrates. I don't know, but I think you know, make or make food thy medicine. You know, but uh, there's a lot to be said in that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. I, I that's where where I began. It was, I got rid of sugar. I mean, I've in, I've reintroduced it now to an eighty twenty rule. I do. Well, it's maybe a strong statement, but I do think sugar is probably the root of all evil. Even though I'm a contra I contradict myself slightly, mm -hmm. I have half a sugar. I used to have three sugars in my coffee. Now I'm mm -hmm. dying down to half. Uh, I do like a little bit of sweetness on a Friday night. We have a movie night, so I have my chocolate. But I look at the shift of habits. I was doing it every night to a large yeah. scale, yeah. Yeah. and I, to to shift my head and my mindset and my habits, I did get rid of it completely. I did actually go cold turkey on it, and after about three or four days, I felt amazing. Uh, and I didn't didn't touch it, didn't feel I needed to touch it. Then reintroduced it, and there's been a a few days in the week I tried to get in the habit of not doing it until the Friday movie night. <laughs> but then there were maybe two or three times over the last year, which I think is pretty good. But during that time, I hated myself for it. I did go on a Tuesday. Bang! I'm going to have some chocolate. I don't care. <laughs> you know, Andy. I, I think again, it, it's it's an individual thing and what works for the uh, person. So long as they're they're healthy and, and they're yeah. okay, and, and totally. And again, not to. It's easy these days. People look at these influencers online, and people think they have to be like so and so and so and so. Mm -hmm. And my advice is take on board all the information you get, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And um, you know, if you like a little sugar, you got a bit of a sweet tooth. Again, the, the mm -hmm. concern of again, what people are going to think about me? How am I going to look? Don't worry about it. Yeah, you, you know, there have been studies done that have proven that people who um, are more real, a bit more relaxed about things like that, uh, you know. Um, so, if, for example, somebody who is super, super vigilant and strict and they stress are going to produce more cortisol in their body, more anxiety because they didn't use the right kind of salad oil dressing as opposed to someone says, you know what, and and that's not the excuse to let yourself go, but, mm. you know, to be able to allow yourself that freedom to be able to enjoy those things um, in moderation, um, I've just found that if I have no sugar, I'm way better off. Yeah. For some other person, it may be 80-20. It's it's what works for you, and and just to be careful not to um, you know look at other people because again sometimes you just don't know um, yeah is sure. what is what's being presented as honest and as accurately as what's being portrayed. Mm -hmm. So um, listen to your body, and if you feel good and you're okay, then just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. No, good good advice. Um, so. At 47, when you made that change, just quickly, how you, you, cause in the pre interview, when we had a chat, you actually, and just to paint the picture a little bit more, um, how much did you weigh? At my worst, I was 170 kilograms. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah. I got down. Me. <laughs> yeah. I, I got down, I got down to a hundred. Mm. Um, but at the time, all the training I was doing was just pretty much exclusive cardio. I didn't do any weights. And so, you know, uh, since then, I've been, you know, doing regular weight training and some boxing. And so I've, uh, in fact, I weighed myself at the gym the other day. Not that I get obsessed with weight, but uh, I clocked in 112. But I, I put on a lot more um, lean muscle mass on then since when I, you know, dropped all my weight. And, yeah. um, you know, when I got down to that level in uh, 20, late 2011, early 2012, yeah. around that time. Okay. I think we, we, so in the modern day, last 13 years, um, what have you done with yourself? I know you've gone in and started to speak um, and, and do public speakings. Just talk about that briefly, going into schools and so on, young men. Yeah, you know, just so, so you know, the last 13 years I've, I've, I've repartnered uh, my wife, Connie, um, who, you know, has, has been an amazing adjunct to, uh, to my life. Um, I've been putting a bit more effort into, you know, speaking to kids, you know, again, mainly, mainly artistic, creative kids, because I'm, what I always hope to do is to try and encourage kids to pursue their dreams and not necessarily look at it just as a, to make a living and put all, all their eggs in one basket. And of course, I encourage them to do so, and, and I hope they do, but it's more about teaching them about process and, 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 and just indulging what they enjoy doing. Uh, in their artistic creative pursuits, but um, also just to speak to men who, who are, you know, find themselves, whether they're, you know, they're addicted to uh, alcohol, drugs, they're unhappy in their marriage, they're overweight, they're, they're, they're in that midlife slump, 
mm. uh, because a, a lot of those changes came to me um, again. I was in my late forties when I was when I hit my worst, and so you know, there's a lot of men in that age bracket who find themselves in similar situations. Um, mm. So you know, I, I I hope that through my story I can um, inspire them and show them that it's never too late to get your life together. Mm-hmm. to sort things out um there's very little that i think is that insurmountable that you can't get over uh and and so and so yeah uh, you know that's really been it just you know continuing with the work here and training young kids to be engineers and looking as to how because you know i turned 60 last year and i don't know 10 years from now will i'll be in the studio i hope the studio will still be here and operating in some capacity but will i still be mastering highly unlikely Mm. And I, I don't believe in the concept of retirement. I think uh, it's important that you have purpose. You need to get out of bed. You need something to do, even if it's on a voluntary basis. Mm. So I think, if anything, the older I get, the more wisdom I get, and uh, perhaps I'll be able to be of more benefit to people, you know, sharing my story in whatever way is going to, you know, serve them in their yeah. own, it, you know. it, It's like your 12th, you know, it's like your 12th step of recovery, isn't it, I suppose? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I guess of sorts. Um, it's interesting, twelve step. Um, I, I did try that for a little while, um, mm. and I, th- I think there's a lot of good things that come uh, from it. But the the one thing that was a big red flag for me that made me want to stop going to the meetings was um, how much they. And and again, I'm, I'm going to stress again. I'm not. I don't want to disparage twelve step. I think. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous done wonderful things, help a lot of people. And just this is just for me personally. But the the biggest flaw I find in that in the program is how they um, how they're so big on the idea of everyone's an addict. And and I understand at the beginning you can say, "Hi, I'm Tony. I'm an addict," because this is you taking responsibility for your. But here I was at going to these meetings and I'd be listening to people who had been clean this over 30 years and they would still say, hi, I'm Joe and I'm an addict. Mm, and yeah. I thought, how, how can you still say you're an addict when you've been clean this over 30 years? And, mm. you know, and, you know, it's one thing to be vigilant, but I think having that, con- that, that to me is like living through a fear paradigm mm. rather than through, you know, being confident, like I've, I've kicked it now and I've, I've, you know, I've, I've got my power back and I'm in control of things, uh, you yeah. know. So, um, and, and so, this is why I said I, I had to start to learn to identify. It was fine in the beginning to say, you know, yes, I'm, yes, I'm an addict and I'm this and I'm that, but, but then at some point, you know, where, where do you actually empower yourself to re- release yourself from that ball and chain, and, and to move ahead, uh, you know, and, and create a new version of yourself that, you know, that sheds that old skin and leaves it in the past. It's you know, a the reason point. why the windscreen the windscreen's bigger than the rear view mirror. Mm. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's all good to be able to look behind every now and again and look into your past. For me, the past is where it's just a reference point. It's mm-hmm. a, uh, a a reminder of things, but it's not uh, where I continue to live because – you know, if I keep dragging my past into the present all the time, then there's going to be no future for me because I'm just constantly going to be wheeling and dealing in that all the time and having that in my mind rather than just, a, a, again, a, a acknowledgement, fine, that's great, acceptance, that's great, responsibility, all good. But at some point, it's sort of like, okay, you know, then that's it when it comes to being a victim. You know, your past is your past. Whatever's happened to you has happened to you. It's unfortunate. It's sad. Uh, acknowledge it. Take ownership of it. Um, it was some of it your fault, some of it not your fault. But regardless, if you just keep hanging on to it and keep running your story around it, then uh, you will never break free from that. It, it's a great point, and um, it's because you know with this, the neuroplasticity that I'm, I'm a massive part. Pa- pa- I have a lot of passion for neuroplasticity at the moment. You know, rewiring of the brain. Yep. If you if you keep if you keep saying those words, you're going to wire your brain to still believe it. Whereas it's almost like they should change it to go, I am no longer an, ab- uh, mm. an addict. I can still come to these things and have this 12 process, 12 step, whatever, sure, sure. but I am no longer an addict. Yeah. I still come, but I'm no longer an addict. It's mm-hmm. like that should be the direction in. Yeah. We should yeah. go in. But what would I know? I haven't developed a, <laughs> a drug rehabilitation program. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah. You know. <laughs> 
we can say it. We can say it, can't we? As well, there's it's, probably it's some very, science it, behind it. It's it's easy to um, it's easy to throw um, you know uh, yeah. throw pot shots in the cheap seats, isn't it? So I'm 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 careful that I don't I don't want to be I don't want to be that person. Okay, so Tony, where where does the future lie for this bright person I see in front of me now? Then, um, well, I, I I would like to think that I'll uh, grow old disgracefully. As I say. <laughs> uh, um, look, I, I guess you know, really, who who, who knows? But if if uh, if I have any say in it, uh, I'd like to think that I'll just keep on the current trajectory and that I'll more opportunities to speak to people and share the story uh, around um, my life and the lessons of my life in, in the hope that people who find themselves in a similar situation uh, can find hope that they too can get out of whatever it is that's uh, bothering them and, and and live more fulfilling lives. Um, certainly this place here and use this place to train young kids and develop young talent because um, I, I feel like while I still am working and doing my thing, um, it's, I've had a good run and it's now time for, you know, for someone like myself and my generation, no matter to pass the torch, share the knowledge, support these kids so that they can get their name up in lights and, and, and be, you know, become prime time, um, you know, and pay forward all the goodness I got through the mentoring I got as a youngster, because, uh, I, I truly believe that it was, um, the mentoring and support I got as a youngster. From engineers who didn't know me anything, you know, big. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about big, big name engineers, who and and I think the greatest thing you can do to a kid, especially or anyone for that matter, but I think especially a kid, is if you can make them feel like you that they feel like you believe in them and they generally feel that. Um, that's the greatest thing I think you can do to a kid to help bolster their confidence so that they can, you know, go ahead and do that thing and and help remove a blockage and help them take the next step. So if you can help them to develop that sense of, you know, their self-worth and that they're worthy and that you are someone that they look up to, believe in them, yeah. it's fuel. It's fuel. I know it was for me mm. and I never forgot that. So, so now, you know, I want to dedicate my life to being able to be somebody who can avail themselves to be a support and to be helpful to the ones obviously who are open and willing to listen and, and, you know, consider what it is I have to bring. Um, mm. So that that's really where it's ahead. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm as, as, you know, we went back to the start of the show about present. I'm really happy with life, mate. I really am. If you said to me, look, if you, you know, you, the next 30 years of your life, which is taken in 90, you know, you're going to have 30 years and not, it's not going to change. It's not going to improve. It's not going to improve much and it's not going to go down too much. I'll take it. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll more than take it because, like I said, I, I'm I'm in in such a good place with life, and I feel so fulfilled with what I do and how I feel. Um, I, I feel so much better equipped now to deal with the ups and downs of life. Um, you know, just have a lot more presence of mind, a lot more peace of mind. So I'm I'm excited about the future. I obviously don't know what lies ahead. Um, I, I don't have any delusions of grandeur in terms of what I'm doing. Um, I think, um, as cliche as it sounds, you, you just need to change one person's life and you've, you've, you've done your job because you just don't know that life, how it's going to extrapolate out into the world in terms of how many other people they may touch and, and you know, impact on in, in a positive kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, well, I think I can tell the authenticity in your words because of your videos that you do the little the little moments on the beach when you're walking with the sunset or the sunrise um that you know follow tony on on social media because these are these are great little motivational speeches i i enjoy clicking on them because i know they're not uh, something that's going to make me think negative or you know the other way just it's just nice to see you doing your thing and asking those questions and putting them out there in the mornings. Uh, it, it it looks like a sunrise. No, it'd be sunset. It's sunrise. Right? Yeah, it's sunrise. I'm always sunrise? There. I'm yep. always in the morning. So, yeah. Uh, and yeah. so yeah, keep keep doing that, man, because I keep enjoying that. Um, but two things before you go, and then just because we'll, we'll wrap it up. But the the first one is, if you had just a one liner, if you if somebody was sitting here now watching it and just wanted one line piece of information just to get them started to get that small one percent habit to change, what what piece of advice would you give to anyone that's suffering, whether it's through alcoholism, drug is you know drugs, whatever it may be, what one line 
Oh, okay, could okay. you give? Well, first of all, just remember there's nothing wrong with you. Mm. And just because, uh, sorry, I'm going to swear. I hope you don't mind. But there's no, a no, lot. go for it, man. Um, just because you fuck up, it doesn't make you one. Mm-hmm. Right? So understand that whatever you may have done, I know it's not online. So sorry, Andy, I know you've already No, 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 it's good. Go for it. Um, just, just understand, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. And or everything, wherever you or me are at any given um, point in time, a snapshot, it's just the result of outcomes due to decisions that we've made. And sometimes things work out okay, and sometimes things don't, things don't work out all right. Life is a feedback mechanism. So as long as you've got the awareness to realise that, you know, it's a mirror, that, that, okay, so when I do that, that happens. Okay, well, I won't be doing that again, uh, and, and, and move on and make some different mistakes. Mm. Um, I think that the, the more mistakes you make, you better. I'm not talking about repeating mistakes and just keep, but mistakes are fine. And yeah. And, and you shouldn't allow yourself, your sense of self-worth, to be determined by the fact that maybe you've uh, done things in your life or are doing things right now aren't, aren't serving you well. But until you have this sense of self-worth and, and, and feeling good enough and feeling worthy enough and having enough self-love, um, a lot of things aren't going to change until you come to that point because no one could do it for you. Nobody. Yeah. Great piece of advice, man. Last thing I want to finish on. What's your purpose? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, I think, uh, I don't, know, I don't even know if I could even answer that. I want to say pur- pur- purpose. I, I, I guess. It, Why I do you like get up out of bed every day? I, okay, no. Let, let me let me try. No, I want to try and entertain that. Um, I, I think that if I had to sort of think of a purpose, I, I guess the, the the purpose here is to be. Um, is to be um, a good person and and a positive impact on people by being um, you know, good to myself, by being a good father to my children, by being a good friend to my friends and and, and, and to colleagues, to being a good husband, um, and and just trying to impart as much positivity and goodwill as I can, if you want to call that a purpose. You know? Absolutely. But the whole idea of being here, really, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's just one big earth school and we're just here to experience and to learn. Mm. And, and that's something we'll keep doing until our, our, our last breath. Tony, I've learned a lot from you today, man. And um, I, I want to thank you for being vulnerable and um, open and raw it's what this is all about, and um, I, I, I think the viewers of leading our own way, um, if there is any, uh, will definitely, definitely, definitely get something from you and in, in, in the journey you've been on. So, Tony, well, from, us, from us all, man, absolutely, thank you so much. Um, so, everybody, I hope you're enjoying the uh, our guests. Wait until next time um, till we uh, share some more inspiring stories for those who have uh, come from diversity or some form of trauma or whatever it may they've been suffering with. And these guys are just going to create a safe space for everybody else to try and do to do their own thing as well and follow their journey. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, once again, from Tony and I, thanks again for, uh, for here from Australia. Leading thanks, our own way. Have All a great right. week, everybody. Thank you. See you, mate. Bye bye. Thanks for listening and watching Leading Our Own Way. So we can stay together forever and share more incredible journeys, please subscribe to the channel. That way you won't miss next week's episode and what that amazing guest has to offer to the world. Please support Leading Our Own Way and we'll get you on next week's episode.